book of Joshua uh, has its parallels with the book of Acts, which is one of my favourite books in the Bible. Uh, it's about the establishment of the kingdom, and whereas it's a, a bit of a different kingdom to the kingdom of the new covenant. Uh, as I read through this chapter, I, I was amazed by how many key truths about God establishing his kingdom are contained in it. And I was encouraged, and I want to, I'd like to share that with you tonight. At the end of chapter 5, uh, we have this meeting, or Joshua has this meeting with uh, this commander of the army of the Lord, who we would take to be the Lord himself. That may be questionable. But uh, it's a moment of uh, worship and commitment for him. He, uh, he falls to the ground and says, Lord, oh, what, Lord, what do you require of your servant? And he's reminded that where he is, the place he stands, is a holy ground. And that's a good place to start if we're seeking to build the kingdom. A place where we, we're aware that we're in the presence of the Almighty God. A place where we, we are bowed in worship and saying, Lord, what do you require of me? Where we recognise... Uh, in a way, the holiness of uh, what we're involved with and where we stand. Now, it's a very different position from just the, uh, the position we sometimes find ourselves in of just saying, uh, Lord, these are our plans, will you bless them? It's a very different place. Uh, so that is uh, Joshua's preparation for this particular task. The first thing I noted when I, we come to this chapter is that uh, God is sovereign. I have given Jericho into your hands. God was building his kingdom and God was directing his people. And God was sovereign, he was in charge. Uh, you know, it wasn't about what Moses was get, what done or what Joshua had got to do. They were his servants. They obeyed instructions. But God was acting to establish a kingdom. So we perhaps uh, need to, to be reminded uh, sometimes that God is actually sovereign. In this world, which is very much sometimes the devil's kingdom, or is the prince of this world, God is is still sovereign. Second thing uh, we would like us to note is that the means <coughs> of, of establishing the kingdom are God's. The way about going about things are, are under his direction. And uh, we need to heed his word, to obey his word, if we want to be part of that. Because the instructions, very often, God's way of doing things are very different from ours. What Joshua is uh, asked to do here is not well-tried military tactics. It's not uh, uh, the normal way to take a city to march round it with, uh, with priests and uh, blowing trumpets. The way and the means that God establishes his kingdom are very different from the ways of the world. And uh, while well, we need to listen to his word, heed his word, seek out his word, and seek to obey it. The third thing, and perhaps the, the very key thing, is that the Lord's presence is central. The abiding presence of the Lord. Uh, Moses, uh, at the beginning of the Exodus, was given the promise uh, by the Lord, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And in this particular exercise, we see that the Ark of the Covenant, that signifying the presence of God, is right in the middle of what is happening. As pr the priests on either side, the military men on either side, but in the middle is the, the Ark of the Covenant, the abiding presence of God. 
And for us, the, the Holy Spirit in our lives, the Holy Spirit uh, bringing the presence of Jesus as we meet together, the Holy Spirit empowering us for ministry is, um, is, is absolutely central to, to the kingdom, to who we are, and to the, the success of uh, God being able to use us to, to establish his purposes. Rahab's testimony was uh, to the spies, uh, you know, we, we, we trembled as we saw what you were doing. Your God is the God of heaven and earth. He's the true God. She saw, and that, well, all the people saw that they, somehow this people were different. It wasn't that they were some advanced military force. Uh, they were... Um, Rahab's testimony is back in uh, chapter 2, I think. <laughs> anyway, uh, but uh, it, was, uh, it was that God was with them. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, where Paul speaks about spiritual gifts, he, uh, where he's speaking about prophecy and when the whole church prophesies, he says, if an unbeliever comes into your meeting, he should fall down on his face, well, fall down on his face and say, God is truly amongst you. The presence of the Lord. That was what made these people different. That God chose to use them to build a kingdom that would seek to honour his name. Just the same for us. Just a weak, lost, sinful people, group of people that have been redeemed by Jesus. But his abiding presence is on us. And he can use us to do amazing things. The central presence of God. third thing I noticed, this perhaps a little bit different, um, going on to verse 10, it's actually, a, it was a silent procession as far as speaking went, up until the moment for proclamation came. And the importance sometimes of waiting upon the Lord is to be silent. We are commanded that in a number of places in the Bible. There is this place of a very much when you're waiting upon the Lord of being silent. These people had had a habit of just voicing their doubts, their um, frustrations uh, and their unbelief and they'd uh, brought uh, disaster upon themselves a whole number of times through the Exodus. This is a time when uh, they, they were promised or Joshua was promised in chapter 3. He was told to consecrate himself that yourselves because I'm going to do wonders amongst you. The almighty God was doing great works amongst his people. And it was a time, a time when they waited upon him and it was a time to be silent unless he called them to speak. It was a, in a way and quite an awesome time. You know, this almighty presence of God doing these amazing things as he established the kingdom. And the place of being silent upon before the Lord um, it is, also has its place along with that a proclamation. Next thing is the timing is the Lord's. They could have walked around 70 times. They could have walked around 700 times. They could have shouted every time. They could have laid siege to the city. They could have done all sorts of things. Nothing was going to happen. It was completely in the Lord's hands. And they couldn't, they couldn't manipulate the Lord. They didn't have the power in their own strength to overthrow this city. It was completely upon the Lord's grace and the Lord's timing. And they had to obey his instructions and wait upon his timing. And it's certainly, I think, over the Christian life, one of the hardest things I've, I've, I've dealt with is that ability to, to try, well, to even to seek to understand the Lord's time, let alone to wait upon him for it. And in a, an instant society, it, um, I think it's perhaps a frustration for many of us. Now, it wasn't a case of going straight in. They had these seven days of uh, waiting. But following that, uh, that, there is the place of praise and proclamation. There was the time when they're called to shout to the Lord, shout for the Lord. 
Uh, there is, we live in a world that likes making a lot of noise and they like uh, shouting at their idols. You only have to look at a, a, foot, a sports event or a football match or anything like that. And it's not that we rival that, but there is great value in the, uh, a praise and proclamation. It tells the Lord that we love him and that we... Uh, but it also, uh, there's value, value, I think, in confession, in, in reassuring us of the truth that we have. Why our Charles Wesley hymns and Isaac Watts hymns are, are full of theology, that you, we're confessing truth. And as we, we confess that truth, it becomes real for us because the Holy Spirit works through it. But there's also, the, uh, I think, the role of uh, telling the devil where we stand and uh, that we stand on the Lord's ground. Great value in proclamation and praise. There's one reason, and one of many reasons, why I think it's important that a, some, a chapel like this is kept open, and uh, that there is a people upholding the name of Jesus and giving praises to him. I think it, I think it just brings benefit to us. Uh, I'm sure it brings great benefit to the, to the community that God's name is the name of the Lord Jesus is upheld within the, same, the middle of the community there's great power in praise and it does bring down barriers it brings down walls as the Holy Spirit works through it next point and uh, Quite a disturbing one, I, I think, um, is that the kingdom is the Lord's, and uh, that we're not seeking our own glory or our own material gain. First verses uh, 18 and 19, and you only have to turn over the page to look at the next chapter and look at the, the sin of Achan to see what a problem that is for us. Somehow, what God has allotted us with is, is sometimes not enough. Sometimes we want to share in the glory. Sometimes we, we, we want, uh, we're not secure, we want material gain, or somehow riches for ourselves. And I think it's probably one of the most crippling factors uh, for the church is that of uh, people seeking their own glory or of their own gain. So something to think about, that's the message of the next chapter, but it, it is uh, there very much that, uh, that yes, look, God was using this people to do great work, but he was building his kingdom and he was using them for his glory. And the final thing, and this is the, the key one. By grace, the lost enter that kingdom. I, I love the story of Rahab. It's one of my favourites. Uh, it's one that it warms my heart. It's like the story of the thief on the cross. It's one of those that uh, is surprising. Uh, it goes beyond, I think, our expectations. It goes beyond... Uh, our expectations of grace, really, uh, we didn't we, most of us, I don't think, would expect this to happen. It's, it's a, a lovely a bonus in this story. That out of a condemned city, a, con, a condemned people, a people under imminent judgment, this woman, this woman perhaps of questionable character, has seen what God is doing and she has reached out in faith and she, she, uh, has sought to join these people and uh, she is saved out of that situation. And it was a wonderful illustration of grace, uh, a grace that perhaps goes beyond our, our expectations and beyond our prejudices. It's a wonderful expectation, uh, example of salvation by faith. It's a, a wonderful ex, uh, example of a ministry to the Gentiles, a ministry that goes beyond the people that we expect to be part of it. 
It's, it blows apart our prejudices or our limited vision. But out of a completely lost situation, like the thief on the cross, uh, people can still be saved and be drawn into the kingdom of God. And Rahab wasn't, just didn't become part of that people. She had a key place there. She became part of the royal line. She has a, a place in the Hall of Fame of Hebrews 11 amongst the greats of faith. She's even a, a, held up by the no-nonsense James as an example of, a, of both work, faith and works. The grace of God that goes beyond what we expect. The kingdom of God is about reaching the lost. And sometimes our limited faith and our limited vision uh, loses sight of just uh, how, how far that grace can reach. So, it may seem quite a violent story from a long time ago, but God is establishing his kingdom. A sovereign God who uses his means a God who is central in the middle of his people. A God who uh, calls them sometimes to be silent, sometimes to pro proclaim his presence. A God that is building a kingdom that will uh, give uh, glory to his name, but also a kingdom which will draw in the lost to salvation. So I hope we can still be encouraged in being part of building that kingdom. The Lord may build the kingdom, but he does want a faithful group of servants to share in that task. Amen.